Hello, everybody. Um, I'm uh, Miraj, uh, Miraj Ahmed. I have been teaching here since 2000, and um, I find myself in diploma school now, uh, having kind of been through various parts of the school. Um, and uh, it's very exciting. Um, and what I, 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 I'm an architect, um, but I also uh, paint. Um, and I've been teaching in uh, Camberwell College of Art, but also um, Cambridge for the last eight years, I, until this year, actually. Um, and um, so I'm kind of dividing my time between uh, uh, teaching and painting at the moment. Um, and uh, I kind of explore architecture through these means, actually. And I think that uh, that's the beauty of architecture, that actually you can practice um, through various different techniques. Um, and this is Martin. Yeah, hi, I'm Martin. Um, I uh, studied here as a mature student, which is a bit unusual in my late 30s, having spent 15 years as a management consultant. Uh, so I spent five years here as a student. So I know what you're about to go through quite well. Um, I've also taught here for five years with Mirage. In fact, Mirage was my tutor here when I was in my, in my first year. So he's still my kind of <laughs> spiritual father. We're, we're very, very, very close in that way. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so when this is our first year in diploma, but we're, we, we're very familiar with the school. This is Newton. Um, uh, he had a kind of strange relationship with Blake. I mean, in, in many ways, Blake hated Newton because he represented the material, but also I think there's a little bit of love going on there as well. Um, Golganuza. Um, we're going to talk about three things today, ab about the unit and what we've done in the past to give you a flavor of the kind of interests we have uh, about the Golganuza and about the imagination and about our site for the year, which is Thamesmead. Um, we always work in London. This is a picture postcard look of London. Everything's clean, everything, the sky is almost blue, everything is ordered. Um, of course, completely not what London's about. This is really what London's about. It's a bit messy. Uh, it's kind of being built, it's kind of falling down, it's dusty, it's dirty, it's disorganized. It's kind of struggling to survive. Um, and why is that? And, and it's really because it's, it's always been a very successful city. I mean, the 19th century went through an industrial revolution, incredibly successful, leading the world. And then as a city struggled through that process, now it's leading the global financial revolution. This is Canary Wharf that brings in a massive amount of power and wealth into the city. And yet the city then attracts people, it attracts culture. One million people have come to the city over the last decade. And it's always struggling to cope with that. So we have this kind of fabric of Victorian houses, which are never quite able to absorb all these people and all this difference. So the question of expansion, of difference, of, of wealth disparity, these are the issues we're interested in. Um, we've always looked at different uh, thinkers and philosophers and writers as a way into this program. So this is Michel Foucault. He coined the term heterotopia. It was a lecture he gave in the 60s. The idea of a little space in time or, or, in, or a spatial where something, I'm doing the same as him, look, <laughs> uh, is intensely different, all right? So this is a project which Wader did, the idea of a garden on the Bank of England, taking the idea of bankers, you think short-term, and introducing to the idea of gardening, working long-term and thinking about growth. And this is a project by Octave, a gallery on the Thames, which is, is completely submerged and then comes back to life again as the tide moves back. Another thing that we've looked at is Georges Bataille, um, again, who hated architecture, who architecture established a community, um, it represented the establishment, and created a dictionary of new words. One of those words was formless, and, and formless is a task. The task is to bring something down, to destroy. So we had the idea of art. This is Urs Fischer, taken into J.P. Morgan. This is the facilities manager of J.P. Morgan, and this is Urs Fischer's artwork, digging up the ground, taken into, 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 a, into a bank. And this is a project by Stefan. Uh, the potlatch concept, where the city kind of consumes itself an orgiastic carnival. And uh, the last of these thinkers is Yves Klein, uh, more contemporary, the father of minimalism, and, and, and fascinated by the void. So here is a, a step well, a, a bath for bankers in the middle of the city. And here's the idea of the sublime, the abyss, uh, inside something as banal as a shopping center in, in Tottenham. And lastly, a project by Richard. Oh, excuse me. I don't know how to stop this happening, but I'll just cancel. 
a project by Richard looking at a kind of contemporary Stonehenge, a slow world, self-built city around Canary Wharf. Oh, this is the last one, in fact. This is Alfred Jarry, perhaps the most bizarre of all. Um, coined the term pataphysics, the world beyond metaphysics, the world of imagination, the science of exceptions as opposed to generalities. Uh, a project by Ahmed, uh, the idea of uh, plants which have emotions, and a rethinking of the Crystal Palace over South Kensington. Oh, and lastly, Bodo. Bodo, this is a, a uh, what do we call it? A folly. It's a folly. A folly to the death of South Kensington. And this year, we, we said, look, we've done a lot of French people. Perhaps it's time to come back to England. And who is more crazy than Alfred Jerry, who's kind of on the edge of normal sanity? And this is uh, William Blake, the, the most visionary of, uh, of 18th century thinkers, of, 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 in recent uh, centuries, his self-portrait, his death mask. So we were looking at William Blake, his imaginary new world of Golganusa, which Mirage is going to talk about. So what ties all these, uh, these thinkers that we've been looking at together is really the, the notion of the other. And, and, and what, what we mean by the other is that somehow um, there's a kind of an ordinary day-to-day -day kind of life, but there's another uh, scenario that, that we all have access to. And, and Blake, I think more than any, has, has uh, constructed this other um, into, a, into a kind of a very formidable kind of work and career. Um, and to understand Blake, I think it's important to understand London of his time. And um, this is Hogarth's London. Um, so, so Blake kind of, that's the London that Blake kind of occupied. And, and um, it was a time of uh, uh, great sort of um, movement for uh, sort of wealth, actually. It was, it was the time of sort of empire building, but it was also incredibly um, scientifically sort of advanced for that time. So the Enlightenment was just coming into the fore. Um, but there was great uh, squalor and social injustice. And this is something that um, Blake was very um, uh, interested in, is, is this, this uh, sort of hope for justice. And, and a lot of his work is, is based on the principle of justice. Um, so Golganuza is, is a construct uh, um, of, of Blake's. It's, it's the other London. So um, it's the inner London, the, the London that exists in our, in our imaginations or his imagination. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a city um, that's constantly being built. It's, it's a strive for, um, for perfection, actually. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a sort of an idea, uh, a striving for an ideal state, um, which we can never quite achieve, but it's this kind of ever building, ever falling kind of scenario that is very much London, actually. Um, Martin kind of showed you some images earlier on, and that's kind of, uh, it, it's, it's maintained from his time onwards, and it's a kind of internal, it's an internal city. Um, so the eternal city of London, or Golganusa, being created and, and, and built, uh, is a kind of re repository for many, many ideas. Um, and a lot of those ideas come from um, mythology. Um, and if we look at the way that um, architecture has kind of incorporated this idea of sort of mythology and uh, I would say sort of uh, mysticism, um, Blake never actually uh, uh, was interested in architecture as, 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 as a kind of profession, but he was interested in the, the processes of building and the processes of that, that building uh, incorporates. And um, this is a tomb uh, for Porsena, um, uh, John Greaves. Um, and um, basically, it's, it's, it's based, on, based on a myth of an Etruscan king. So it's a tomb for an Etruscan king. So, so what's interesting is the, is the presence of myth embodied in architecture. And that's something that we're kind of interested in, as this kind of um, the idea that uh, the, the architecture is a kind of an accumulated language. Um, and if we understand that language, we can start to create poetry through architecture. And um, the other thing about uh, architecture, and, and again, that's something that kind of relates to Blake, is, is expression. And this is uh, Gaudi's Casa Mila. And, and the idea that, that again, that, that materials and structure can embody um, this sort of uh, more esoteric and, and sort of spiritual um, 
idea. Um, oh. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, and we can, we can kind of trace that through early modernism. And, and one of the things that, um, uh, the, that we kind of know about modernism, this is the Gothenaeum, um, that, that actually um, the ideas that kind of uh, were sort of being espoused or kind of explored were, were very um, esoteric. And uh, a lot of it was coming out of the East. And uh, there was kind of Eastern philosophies that were be being kind of read. There was Madame Bl Blavatsky who was kind of processing that kind of information. This is Rudolf Steiner who was kind of um, talking about these e esoteric and kind of spiritual matters, but also um, Malevich and uh, various other artists were kind of incorporating these these kind of things into their work. And this, the resultant kind of expressionism um, or abstraction was very much a result of these kind of uh, ideas. And Here's an example of a kind of uh, uh, a literary text being kind of incorporated into an architecture. This is Danteum by Tirani, um, a representation of uh, the Divine Comedy as uh, embodied in, in architecture and in, in the fabric and material of a building. So it's literature expressed through architecture. And of course, uh, Le Corbusier and his, his kind of uh, explorations in painting, this is a, a, a painting of a bull. So there's, there's a kind of an inherent sort of uh, interest in mythology, even though we don't actually uh, sort of um, associate Le Corbusier with, with mythology. It, it's there and you see it in his later works. And, um, and the way that these things kind of get embodied through his architecture, he, you can kind of see that there is a kind of direct relationship between his paintings, his sculptures, and his, his, his works. Um, and the, this is a, an architect, called, little known architect called uh, Pancho Guedes, uh, Portuguese, who, who um, was doing a lot of work in Africa. But again, this idea of embodiment. And uh, uh, he was very interested in surrealism um, and made many sort of exploratory paintings. But this is a kind of exploratory painting of a block of flats, which I think is rather lovely. Um, and the, the way that the, these kind of forms start to kind of integrate into his kind of architecture is, is very fascinating. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, um, John Hayduk, a, a poet, an architect, um, who kind of developed a kind of body of work that was based on his understanding of architectural forms that came out of history, but also out of sort of literature and poetry. So, so again, like um, Tirani, he's kind of taking uh, very literary ideas and then um, transforming them into a into a kind of into a kind of lexicon or, or sort of uh, a series of sort of architectural forms, and Massimo Scolari, who's kind of making these very um, sort of mythical landscapes, um, and we're very interested in the way that we uh, that we kind of develop our ideas, and and through the unit we want model making to be very very important this year. Um, this is a model by James Casebeer, and um, what he does is he, he creates these kind of mythical architectural scenes. Um, this is actually a model, uh, probably about 1 to 20, sometimes 1 to uh, 10. So they're very elaborate models purely for the sake of making a photograph. And it's a wonderful technique to, to uh, explore light and, and materiality. Um, so that, that's something we'll be quite... Uh, mindful of. And of course, um, going back to Blake, and uh, we, we're quite interested in that um, the, the kind of representational techniques of, of engraving, um, the, which is a kind of long drawn out process, um, is something that we're quite interested in because of that process, because of the construction of the image. Uh, we think that's a great way to kind of explore uh, um, the buildings that you will be uh, working on. Um, and of course, uh, contemporary painting, this is uh, Richard Hamilton, and, and we're looking at Thamesmead. One of the things about Thamesmead is that it, it was uh, created at a time um, when the sort of contemporary culture was really uh, sort of coming into full swing, swinging 60s. And um, we're going to be looking at that kind of technique also, 
um, to construct images of the home. Um, this is uh, Dexter Dolwood. Um, it's uh, basically a, a vision of, of um, oh, sorry, cancel. Kurt Cobain's um, greenhouse. So it's a kind of an imagina imaginary world. Um, so Thamesmead. Um, before we go to Thamesmead, I mean, one of the things about London is that it's kind of resistant to, to uh, a proper town plan. And this is um, Christopher Wren uh, rebuilding of uh, um, the city after uh, 1666, the Great Fire. And um, he was kind of uh, influenced by uh, the, the great boulevards and the kind of the, the town plans of sort of uh, continental Baroque Europe. But it never really took shape. And that's the thing about London. It never really absorbs uh, a proper town plan, I th which I think is quite interesting. Um, and um, this was a kind of visionary moment uh, in London's history. And you see this kind of time and time again. It sort of crops up. So. Um, uh, so th this is another kind of town plan for Hyde Park. Again, a kind of formal, a formal plan integrated into the city. Um, and then we get sort of moments of visionary sort of uh, uh, town planning. This is Robert Owen's ideal village. He went on to the US and uh, created New Harmony, um, but it never happened here. Um, and then we get, actually this, this actually did influence quite, quite a great deal in, in, in England. This is Ebenezer Howard, um, the, the Garden City, which actually did have uh, an effect. And it's, it's kind of, we, as a result of that, London has a kind of green belt. We also have Letchworth. There's a poster for Letchworth, and there's well in Garden City. So th these moments are kind of moments of visionary sort of uh, um, thoughts that have kind of manifested into, into architecture. And this is a uh, uh, Quarry Hill in Leeds. So it's modeled on um, uh, the Karl, uh, Karl Markshof in Vienna. So this was uh, 1938. So England kind of does absorb various things, but never fully. Um, Ville Radius, so this was kind of instrumental in, in the modernist sort of um, uh, vision of London. So this is the post-war moment in sort of visionary London. Um, Alexander Road by Neve Brown. And then we're going to talk about uh, Peabody's. Yeah, Peabody. So um, we've, yeah, we've talked a lot about um, poetry and art and, and vision and imagination, and that's a very important part of what we do. But we're also interested in, um, in power and money and, and, and the real world and things happening. And this is uh, George Peabody. He was the Bill Gates of his time in the 1860s, the wealthiest man perhaps in the world, and the first, the very first philanthropist before Rockefeller, um, an incredibly successful banker, funded uh, the US railroads, and, but lived in London, and gave up most of his fortune to uh, the poor here in London, set up a trust, the role of which was to house the poor. Um, so they still exist. They have a property portfolio of four billion. They have 200 property sites within the M25. They house something like 50,000 people. So this is, although people don't really realize it, this is the most powerful organization in housing and in city building in London. All right, so we thought, well, if we're interested in London, we're interested in the real world of London, we should go and see these people. So we saw them last, uh, last year, in fact, and said, um, we're from the AA, uh, what are the biggest problems you have? Can we help you work on those? And they said, the biggest problem we have is Thamesmead. We've just bought the Galleons Housing Association. They have a city, a kind of a, a town, a new town, which is built in the 60s, of 50,000 people. And this is a complete and utter disaster. And they don't know what to do with it. So we said, we'll help you work on that. So you can't think of Thamesmead without thinking of uh, The Clockwork Orange. And this was a book written by Anthony Burgess in the 60s. It's a dystopian novel. Um, it's about violence. Ultraviolence, you would call it, um, and and about social conditioning, about aversion therapy, and the role of the state in changing the minds of young people. 
The book's quite well known um, and quite celebrated. The film is even more well known, uh, made into a film in the early 70s by Stanley Kubrick. Um, you couldn't see that film in the UK for 30 years, um, although it was nominated for four Oscars, because it was considered to be too violent, too, too unpleasant. Um, we were going to show you some of the film, but we're not going to show you now because it won't play. But this gives you an idea. Uh, as Malcolm McDowell, that's Thamesmead, oh, excuse me, that's Thamesmead in the background. So this kind of ultra-violent, dystopian film was set in Thamesmead. Uh, this was 1971, when Thamesmead was still, actually, a very interesting and beautiful place. So see, this was the original master plan, 1967. This is the Thames, and here we have a kind of south of France type marina with yachts and beautiful houses and stuff. So, there was an incredible vision at the time. There was some very interesting architecture, an interesting mirror plan, beautiful massing, terraces, what's not to like. Uh, lakes, massive man-made lakes, uh, beautifully massed, carefully detailed buildings, um, and, and lovely landscape. So that was the vision. I'm not gonna show, we're going to show you, this is 1971. That's when the clock stops for us. It went downhill very fast. It was isolated. It was poorly served. Uh, there was massive cost cutting. It's a big, big problem. So we'll end with the vision. What it could have been, might have been, was the, the challenge for us is to work with Peabody. So it's a real client um, and to see what we can come up with, but in a visionary way. OK, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.